Okay, hi there, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on teaching with census data. So, first of all, just um, the focus of this is around census data, and the examples that I'm drawing from are for England and Wales. But to be aware, in the UK, there are three statistical authorities the Office for National Statistics for England and Wales, the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency for Northern Ireland, and National Records of Scotland for Scotland. Um, the England and Wales and Northern Ireland censuses were conducted in 2021. Scotland delayed them for a year till 2022. So their data releases are um, a little bit behind the schedule for England and Wales. Um, for all of them, we have univariate and multivariate data um, we'll show you examples of those afterwards. Um, and the microdata and flow data are available from England and Wales. Northern Ireland's um, versions are due in 2024 and Scotland's in 2025. Um, I think there's a kind of ongoing um, debate about where this goes from. So part of the quality assurance for the census was based on um, using administrative data to check the robustness of the census estimates and a lot of testing went on and that's leading into a program to decide on whether or not we have census 2020 2031 uh, or whether that is sourced from administrative data sources so first of all let's just think about the subject areas you're teaching so if this is this is an open box so if you just type in your subject area here again on the menti code so it looks like we've got a few criminologists, social scientists, social policy, um, social geography, some medical, different medical sciences, health, um, librarianship, and um, some more methodological things. So information literacy and quantitative methods and research methods. Um, so an interesting mix of people, uh, hopefully, you'll draw something from this for all of you. So um, I'm just thinking about what the focus of your teaching is. You can answer up to all of these if you want to. So whether you're involved in research methods, substantive topics, or supervising research. So again, if you could select, I feel like I should be commenting on a horse race here. Research methods coming up behind. Let's give a few more seconds to see if it catches up with substantive topics. Okay, so the next slide asks you for whether you use census data in your work. So that work could be your own research or it could be your teaching, either one. Okay, so quite a lot of you don't use census data at the moment. So it's nice to see you're interested and hopefully um, we will demonstrate enough to show you how it might be valuable in aspects of your teaching. And the last question here, is how confident do you feel about using census data? So um, just having a look at these different things, again, you can just put a click on the bar where you feel you are. So do you understand the variables that are available? You, can you see the types of associations um, that students might explore? And feeling confident about preparing materials. Let's give a minute more for people to think about that. So quite a quite um, a variable set of responses. So um, in terms of understanding the variables available, probably um, kind of a slightly lower levels of confidence, quite a spread on the types of associations and um, confidence in teaching, um, preparing materials uh, lower. So I think that's um, one point at which I can plug something we're gonna do in the future before I go on to what we're going to cover. Um, so I'm doing this this webinar, but my colleague Faseed is also here. Um, he will be taking over the lead on census um, work in the future with the UK Data Service, and I'll provide his contact details at the end. But one of the tasks he has is to um, work on developing um, materials for people to come in and, and pick up and use. So from... Um, fairly simple materials, probably targeted at schools and maybe first year undergraduates on doing some basic work with the census through to kind of quite supporting quite specialist training that's done by 
um, other experts from around the service. So what I'm going to cover today are the kind of outputs that we um, are available, uh, the geographical scope of those. And I think one of the things to highlight here is does a census gives us some real geography, whereas a lot of our other data sources are quite limited in the geography they make available because they're, they're based on survey data. I'm going to have a look at the data, um, some tools, uh, thinking about practical exercises on what we might do, and then at the end to reflect on what this might mean for your teaching and to address any issues that come up. So first of all, what kind of census outputs are there? Well, there's geographical data, um, univariate data, the ONS call those topic summaries. Uh, they also provide area profiles. Um, multivariate data, so predefined and flexible tables, and then data for kind of specific, more specialist areas, so alternative population bases. For example, the daytime populations, the working populations, um, small population groups, um, and then flow data and microdata. And I'll explain more about each of those as we go along. So geographical data is um, used largely to draw maps. And, and some of the examples I will use will be towards mapping. My own experience has been using um, census data in uh, teaching geography, basic, basic kind of methods in geography, and uh, using that to map areas. So the kinds of boundaries that we have are those administrative ones, um, local authority, health, uh, there are others being developed. So we've got ones like local enterprise partnerships and so on. Um, the electrical, elect, electoral, sorry, those two notes at the bottom should have been removed. Um, it's from a previous thing. So we get um, parliamentary constituencies, Welsh constituencies, um, Scottish and Northern Irish constituencies and assemblies. Um, and we also get ward level data. And then the statistical areas that are built on output areas. So all of those geographies are now available. Um, so one of the first tasks to think about in um, terms of planning teaching is what's your geographical scope? Are you looking at national the national picture? Are you looking at region, local authority? Or are you going down to kind of neighbourhood level within a local authority? Um, you might also be looking at country and workplace. Um, so I'm going to focus really on output area geography because I think for teaching purposes, that's probably the most powerful. Um, the output areas were introduced in 2001 and the idea was to create more homogenous areas and more stable areas that have previously been available. So in prior censuses before 2001, the collection area was simply defined as an area to collect the data from. So it had no particular characteristics necessarily. It was just a geographical space within which the data collection for the census was organized. Um, the output areas have been harmonized around issues like tenure and aspects of the population. And they have a, a kind of particular size. So a minimum of 40 households, maximum of 250 with a target somewhere in the middle. Um, and the aim of those was also to try and minimize changes. So it's easy to see change over time. So if you try to look at change over time with electoral wards, when the ward boundaries are redrawn, you would lose um, quite a lot of that ability to be able to look over time and, and they're much larger areas. So those output areas are used, are building, are used as building blocks um, to build up to lower layer super output areas. Um, and there's a number of published statistics at that level. So for example, the index of multiple deprivation is calculated at that level. Recorded crime is reported at that level. Um, and then the largest group is the mid-level super output areas, uh, mid-layer. Um, they're probably about the size of a ward, typically. And again, some statistics are published at that, at that level, like educational attainment and COVID cases. So all of those boundaries are constrained within local authorities. So we don't get um, 
uh, output areas or or higher level output areas, higher area output areas going across the boundaries of local authorities. And just to give you an example, these are the six London boroughs involved with the Olympics and using other households as a proxy measurement for houses under multiple occupation. Um, it, so these are houses with unrelated adults and no children. Um, and we can see here, looking at the mid-layer super output area level, um, the concentration around parts of Tower Hamlets, Hackney, Newham, of these, these types of household. So the darkest shade is 20% of those types of household and over. Um, if we move down a level to the lower layer super output areas, we get much more granularity. We could begin to see specific pockets within areas that weren't visible before um, in the same way. So a, a set of pockets around Waltham Forest. And if we move down to the lowest level available um, output areas, we can see really quite fine granularity of that household type. So these are drawn from topic summaries on household composition. So that was the kind of geographical data. So just to remind you, if you have questions, then please put them into the chat. Um, sorry, into the Q&A box. Um, so we then look at the aggregate data products. So these are um, counts within geographical areas. And the univariate data has a number of kind of topic summaries. Um, so typically, um, well, not typically, demography and migration, a whole set of things around ethnic group, national identity, health and disability, housing, labour market, travel to work, new questions for the 2021 census on sexual orientation and gender identity, um, on education and on UK Armed Forces veterans. Um, and we can look at those as multivariate tables. So we can, there's a set of defined tables um, produced by ONS, including two or more variables, variables at different geographical scales. Um, and then there is also within the ONS interface and within the Northern Ireland statistics, NISRA and NRS, what's called a flexible table builder, where we can decide what we want to analyze. Um, in those dynamic table builders, um, a, a method of statistical disclosure control is used to suppress any areas where the items might be disclosive. So you can play around with those and get to a certain point, but there is a limit to how far you can go because the counts become very small. What that does mean is that when you're thinking about your analysis, you might need to balance geographical scale with the level of detail that's involved. So the other types of data. So first of all, there's flow data. So this has um, been around since 1981. What it does is take the origin and destination of um, flows captured within the census. So it covers migration, um, particularly useful for internal migration patterns. Um, it looks at workplace flow, commuting. Um, there's a note of caution about the census being taken in 2021 during lockdown, that workplace flow will be limited to those who are in essential posts. So it won't be really comparable with historical uh, versions. Um, the second address flow, this is defined as where somebody has a second address where um, they spend more than 30 days, has spent more than 30 days in the last year. Um, and they, it captures reasons for that second address flow. And then student term time and home addresses. Now these, the flow data comes with other variables. So you can look at patterns of migration around individual characteristics. The next type of specialist data is microdata. And this is um, a multivariate sample from the census. So typically the safeguarded version, which you can access um, as a registered uh, user of the UK data service, has around 85 variables um, and enables you to do more complex multivariate analysis than you can do with the um, table builders and the described tables. Um, We've talked about alternative population bases a bit, but it has workplace, workday, out of term and second address population bases. And then for some of the categories, 
there are detailed breakdowns um, available at whatever level is non-disclosive, I think. And those cover things like ethnic groups. I think in the ethnic group case, there are over 250, similarly with country of birth. So in the standard tables, you will get a summarized set of defined classifications. These ones are based on writing answers by people who respond in so in terms of ethnic group, country of birth, religion, and national identity. Um, so they, they're not really, they're available as univariate tables, so they can be interesting and they give some sense of geography, but they are quite different. You can't use them with other variables. So just thinking about what you might look at, um, some of the things you might do, you might look at population, migration, living arrangements, etc. You might look at things around people's identities, around work, around education, whether people are studying. Um, one of the examples I always use of my students I taught in Nottingham was to look at the um, pop a population pyramid uh, for Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, which revealed the kind of um, large number of young people, partly in education, possibly partly working. Um, a whole set of inf information about housing um, and around health. I would say the health is um, limited because it's subjective um, health. It's a rating of how, how healthy you feel um, or whether people have long-term health problems or disabilities or whether they provide on-paid care. So interesting data, but probably not to the depth some people might like it. So, for example, if you look in Scotland, when you look at health, they have a number of conditions that they identify. So you get a lot more details about um, health in the Scottish census, or you will. So um, when you come to access the data, there are three interfaces available. So one is ours, the UK Data Service. Um, there is a package called NOMIS, which has historically been used quite a lot by local government. And for the first time this year, uh, ONS. Um, so the, both the UK Data Service and NOMIS just provide the defined set of multivariate tables. And this means that they might be quite closed at times. So um, in some examples, you will find they use less detailed categories because they're using what's been published. Whereas the ONS inter interface allows you to select variables and to select the number of categories. And it will tell you if your outputs are limited because of statistical disclosure control. So I was just looking at an example for some research I'm doing at the moment, um, which um, I was looking at ethnicity of people living in commercial flats for um, because for a paper I'm doing. And what it told me was that if I wanted to look at housing deprivation as well, I would lose most of the areas. If I, if I left housing deprivation out, I would only lose one area. And I guessed that area was either the Isles of Scilly or the City of London. So I was quite comfortable with that. Um, the way the data comes is also different. So no misoutput is tabular but the UKDS and ONS has a line for each category. So this is the kind of no missed data format. So I pulled this off in preparation for this. What this gives is counts by age of um, all persons in Cardiff and ethnicity. So you can see the ethnic categories down the side, the age bands across the top, um, and this is selected for Cardiff Local Authority in Wales. Um, it's, it's limited, so I couldn't change the age categories here. Um, what I got was this. And this is the way that the UKDS and ONS data would look. Um, now, here I use the flexible table builder, and I ended up with six categories. So I had 15, 16 to 24, etc. Um, for each of the ethnic groups. And these, again, are in Cardiff. So you can see there's a difference. There's a processing requirement here to turn this into a table. And if you want to talk about that, then, then pop something in the chat and I can show you. But just trying to summarize, 
what those and where those are up to um and where they're going as well because i know the plan for the uk data service being a part of it um i don't think there's much more plan for nomis i think they've got to the where they're going to which looks quite like 2011 now so there's a list of tables with variable filters so you um you can go in you can click on a variable filter and it'll tell you what tables are available with that variable you can select the geography typically you can select um individual areas as i did with cardiff or you could select um areas within a, a larger area so if you wanted to look at local authorities in wales you could say look at those and the output format would be table based there's no category selection you get what you're given um and there is historical data on nomis so you can go back in fact, they've just put up 1921 data, um, very different to more recent censuses. It's not, um, it's not um, in the same format at all, really. But interesting to look at if you're interested in historical stuff. Um, and what you will see is that the 2011 and 2021 interfaces look quite similar. Prior to that, you have to pick blocks of data and then select out what you want. Um, so you can navigate to similar tables, but it doesn't feel as intuitive and you can't see all the choices you might have. Um, in the ONS version, you get a list of predefined tables with variable filters, or you can build a custom data set. Similar geographical um, selection, uh, but you get the, a line for each category. Um, you can change the number of categories uh, you're looking at it will tell you if that hits disclosure rules, uh, but the ONS site only has 2021 data. Um, so in terms of UKGS, you can get a list of tables with variable filters. There isn't currently geographical selection. You get a line for each category and you can't select categories. Um, what's planned to be released in 2025 is a common interface for all census data from 1961 to 2021 and that will allow geographical selection it will also allow filtering um, and will give a harmonized interface so if you are working on a more historical kind of approach trying to understand what happened change over time you would might find that very useful but that's not planned until next year um, so then thinking about the geographical data um, we provide data in um, Shapefile, commonly used for ArcGIS, um, other mapping, KML, MapInfo tab, and CSV format. Um, it's open access data, so it doesn't require registration. And you can either get easy download, which gives you the download for a country or for the UK, or you can go into a boundary selector. These are quite, in Shapefiles, are quite large data sets. So, uh, you may want well want to subset the data before you download it. Uh, the links are here, and so when they, um, the presentation is loaded up, you'll be able to follow through those links. Uh, in terms of microdata products, there are a number. So um, census microdata is available at three levels. So there's open data, which has about 18 variables. That can be access to ONS and UKDS. The safeguarding data is only available from UK data service and you need to be registered to access it. Um, and secure data is only available to accredited researchers and is subject to approval of your proposed research. Um, that can be accessed through ONS or UKDS. Um, if you're interested in what those security levels mean, mean in more detail, again, pop something in the chat and we'll cover it as we go along. So what data sets are available? There's a 1% open access at regional level, 1% safeguarded access, um, which goes into an international um, repository in somewhere in America. I can't remember if it's Minnesota or Massachusetts. But, um, and it's um, all countries who do a census, which is most countries provide that. We can get 5% safeguarded access at combined local authority level. So what it means by combined local authority level is there's a cutoff 
with local authorities under 125,000 population are combined. So there's around 270 rather than the 309 that are there and a 5% safeguarded access at regional level. And then there's a 10% secure access local authority data set, which I think has around 120 variables. And then we also get house, household data. So there's 1% safeguarded access household data at regional level and 10% secure access local authority level data. So those are the micro data sets available. And then finally, flow data. Um, we're in a, 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 a changing period. So uh, there's the, the types of data sets. So looking at commuting, internal migration, second homes, student term time and home address with individual level variables. Um, so the safeguarded data sets are available from an old interface called Wicked um, for 1981 to 2011, and a bulk download is available for 2021. But there's shortly um, a new interface, well, it's in development and testing at the moment, that will provide uh, integrated access to all of the data, as with the boundary data and the plan for the aggregate data. It's expected to be released uh, at the end of this year or early next year, and there will be a training course and support materials provided along with it. So then just thinking about the kind of support materials we've got. Um, so we have a regular program of events on using census data, targeted at researchers and analysts, and there's a link there to um, go and dynamically query what's coming up or what has been there before. Uh, so you can look at materials from previous events that are available there. Um, we're in the process of developing um, what we call a synchronous learning material. So things that you can pick up and use yourself um, and they will be being released through 2025. Um, there are currently materials available on the learning hub, but they will be greatly enhanced during the coming months. Um, the ones that are particularly useful now might be the explainers for key census variables. So talking about the new variables on um, gender identity, uh, sexuality, um, and veterans, and also some of the more complex to topics like race migration. And I think, again, there will be others developed as we, as we go through. So let's just have a look at some examples of what we might do. So um, this is a table. So this reflects things I've done, I suppose. Um, and what we have is the number of people and the number of households um, who experience housing deprivation. So across the country, around 7 million people and 2 million households experience housing deprivation. And that's defined by the census as being either overcrowded, lacking central heating, or sharing a kitchen or bathroom. And we can see as we look down in terms of either households or individuals, kind of quite different rates between different groups. So for example, 25% of Bangladeshi's uh, households and 43% of Bangladeshi people are housing deprived compared to 5% and 7% of white British respectively. Now we can do something else with that, which is to um, produce a chart. So this shows um, housing deprivation by um, arrival. Uh, year of arrival in the UK. So what it kind of suggests is that for those who come more recently, they're more likely to be housing deprived. But there, for some groups particularly, there's quite a um, a picture of those born in the UK being housing deprived. Now, I suspect that this uh, is it in part at least reflects children being born to those who've migrated relatively recently. So they inherit the kind of characteristics of the household they're born into. Um, and in this one, we're looking at tenure change over time. So this is a piece of work I've been involved in recently here, which shows change from 2001 to 2021. And you can see here, this is an inner city, um, work, was a working class district, 
you can see a growth in ownership and a significant fall in social renting, <clears throat> an increase in private renting, um, and also an increase in households. And if we wanted to look at a map, this is part of a similar piece of work. This shows how tenure has changed in Manchester since 1981 using census data. So if you look on the left, um, where you can see Manchester written, that's the city centre. So in 1981, very few people living there, large numbers of social housing in pockets around the centre and in the south of the city, um, within shore. As we move to 1991, we can probably see the impact of um, the right to buy. So in the south, we see a lot more blue colours, um, people buying their homes. Uh, we can see that happening around outside of the city centre to the north as those grow. But still, the centre of the city is relatively unpopulated. As we move on to 2001, we can see the centre of the city being developed, increases in ownership and, um, and private renting. Um, we can see continuing reduction in social housing. Um, moving into 2011 and 2021, we can see much greater population of the city centre, so that previously uh, post-industrial space has been transformed. Um, and the graph at the bottom shows how that change has taken place. So a gradual increase in ownership, um, a real dip in social housing between 1981 and 2001, the slight build up, but since 2001, also a big increase in um, private renting. So um, what I want to do now is just to invite you really to, to think about what you've seen so far and to place some questions and some discussion points, your observations into the Q&A so we can begin to think about how you might use census data for teaching. Uh, and those questions can be about how to, as well as what the substantive topics might be. Okay, I think we're kind of, looks like we're coming to the end. If you want to contact us then, then please um, pick up the email addresses there and email us.